anthropology at Rutgers University. Uh, uh, so I agreed to do this because it's the sort of thing that I do in the classroom of facilitating discussions. Um, uh, so what, we, what we're going to do, the way we're going to do this is we have two presenters or respondents, you could say, from the Clamshell Alliance. Uh, that is Nellia Sargent, who was involved with it from the beginning uh, through the uh, American Friends Service Committee and is still involved in the Einstein Institute, uh, perpetuating the work of Gene Sharp in nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, we also have Paul Gunter, who's another co-founder of the Clamshell mm -hmm. Alliance going back to 1976 and has continued his own work against the nuclear industry through the organization Beyond Nuclear. Um, and Arnie Alpert, um, who's uh -huh. probably known to all of you, may, yeah. may throw, in, throw in one or two comments uh, if his technology allows him. Um, so let's see. And, and so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of pose general questions to Paul and Nelia. And then, you know, during appropriate breaks, invite anybody to ask questions, which I hope you'll do. Um, let's see, because you're on two screens, probably the best thing to do is for people to use the chat function. And if you want to ask a question, just say stack or something in the chat function and I'll keep a list. Um, and I may um, pose a kind of question, a comparative question to people from no coal, no gas, principally leaf, um, if that seems appropriate. Kendra was gonna do that, but uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna push you, throw you under the bus there, leaf uh, in her place. Um, so the first kind of concerns, I'm, I'm interested in how the Clamshell Alliance got launched. Uh, back in 1976. So for Paul and Nelia, I mean, how did you choose your, your targets? How did you set, well, actually, tiny bit of further, further bit of background um, to interrupt myself. What we're interested in here are really kinds of process and nuts and bolts things. Um, because the people who, who wanted to have, people from no coal, no gas, who wanted to have this happen, and I presume all of you on the call, um, really find that there's an immense amount that we can learn now from the successes and uh, and possibly from some mistakes of the uh, Clamshell Alliance. So we want to harvest that wisdom from Paul and Nelia about things like organizing, about goal setting, about decision making, consensus building. Uh, how do you grow a movement like this and how do you encounter adversity from the state, the police industry and so on? and achieve success? And how do you deal with failure too? So, uh, so the, the, these initial questions then, as I was saying for Paul and, and Nelia are, how did, you, how did you launch? With what kinds of, how did, you, uh, how did you decide upon targets? How did you decide upon the geographical catchment for recruiting activists? Um, how did you organize things initially into a decision-making structure? Um, so maybe uh, maybe I'll kick it to Nellia first, and then then ask Paul if you can both make contributions to that question. Well, thank you, David. I um, am eager to hear from Paul as well as Arnie, if Arnie's able to participate. Uh, Lamshell was truly a grassroots movement. It began as a, and Paul should really speak to the very beginning. He was part of a wonderful, I would ask Paul to tell his covered wagon story. Um, and it was, we, we were inherently decentralized. We were inherently rotating leadership and our structure was always predicated on the affinity group. The affinity group was the basis and the core, and we had a very strong code of conduct right from the very beginning, uh, a nonviolent discipline. And it evolved as, as we evolved, the, the discipline evolved, the code of conduct did grow, but the, the core was there right at the very beginning. Um, hey, Nellie, Nellie, can I interrupt you there? Just tell please. people the, the, what you mean by affinity group and how that operated, please. Okay, yes, thank you. Please do interrupt. I re welcome mm -hmm. interruptions. Um, the affinity group is a group of 
people who at the very least have been through a six to eight hour nonviolent training preparation session together. Um, you know each other's names, you know a little bit about each other. There, are, there were decisive roles that were offered that people could step into if they were comfortable. So that, for instance, if, if one of my affinity group members didn't was tongue-tied when a microphone got shoved in their face, they could point to this other person who was the media person. Another person was the spokesperson to coordinate back and forth to fast decision-making structures. Um, another person would be like a medic. Another person was sort of the vibes watcher, um, et cetera, et cetera. The affinity group was a group of people, 10 to 20 people, um, who knew each other knew their we knew each other's first names and no matter how fast the police could divide or or um separate people we'd be reforming affinity groups we were amoeba like in that sense in an arrest situation mm. new affinity groups would form instantly and we would do this bonding that was pretty magical um so that we were very much like an amoeba i mean if you cut us in half we just <laughs> reformed and it was very, very important to have that code of conduct, the nonviolent training preparation sessions, which were not negotiable. People were forever trying to get us to cut it down to, you know, two hours, three hours. And there was there were a number of agenda items that were just not negotiable that had to we had to go through to be part of any civil disobedience action. Now one could be a member of Clamshell Alliance without having gone through a nonviolence preparation session. But if one was going to take part in any civil disobedience action, training was a must. I'd like to pass uh, it first on to Paul. Back to the affinity group, forward. back to the affinity group, Nelia. Um, since you, you did this long before Zoom, um, were these based on a, on a town where the six to eight people were living or, or how was the affinity group bounded? Okay, the affinity group, it varied, but often, yes, it was sometimes a geographical location. People who knew each other previously from their residential locations. Sometimes it was a work uh, affinity. Sometimes it was um, college affinity, for instance. Um, <laughs> Goddard College, um, my husband was part of an affinity group that trained 25 more affinity groups up in central Vermont. Um, <laughs> it, it varied a great deal, but th there was always, at the minimum, sometimes it was people who came together simply for the training and met in the training session. And so if the training session was just before an action, there was very little time, but Often there were months ahead of an action when the trainings would take place, and then there could be months of doing projects together and building that affinity, different kinds of projects, whatever inspired the group. Collect we were always based on consensus. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if that answers your question. All right, well, that's extremely helpful. There'll, there'll, there'll be more. Paul, would you want to add, supplement that? Please. Yeah. Um well, thank you again for this invitation. I, you know, first of all, I just want to say that I'm uh, awed by uh, your work and your uh, commitment and the fact that uh, you're, um, you know, if, if I could say, you know, we're all part of a legacy. Um, but, um, I, you know, to really start things off, I have to say that the clamshell uh, got its legacy originally from organizing against uh, the Onassis movement to put offshore oil drilling off the coast of New Hampshire. A lot of our uh, founding organizers uh, came out of the opposition to offshore oil drilling. So, you know, there's a lot of common ground um, that you are a part of. Um, there were other organizations statewide in New Hampshire, like the Granite State Alliance, that was similarly dedicated, not, not necessarily to environmentalism, but um, to oppose uh, corrupt, co corrupt, uh, corrupt corporations, for example, uh, which, uh, you know, 
and and also people's rights. Uh, so uh, it just sort of fell in that the um, public service company of New Hampshire, when it announced um, that it was going to build a nuclear power station um, on a uh, Indian burial ground, which got a number of us involved uh, and, and concerned, but also a small rural town um, that uh, over the process had basically in a town meeting said they didn't want a nuclear power station built by Westinghouse um, in this town that, you know, um, was uh, was made popular really by the fact that it was um, Al, it was for Al Cap, uh, the cartoonist, uh, got his inspiration for the cartoon strip, Little Abner. And that was the kind of, of um, setting that, you know, the, um, the town wanted to uh, keep itself as a resort town and, uh, you know, and, and tourism. And nobody believed that it was that that was going to keep that way if they built uh, either an oil drilling operation or a <clears throat> twin nuclear power station. So, um, but uh, there was already pretty much an infrastructure from that campaign combined with other groups like uh, the Granite State Alliance that set it up for, um, face-to-face -face organizing uh, to say that, uh, you know, we were going to oppose, oppose this. We had lost our patience as well uh, with the fact that public service company had all the lawyers. They captured the regulatory process. Um, the Atomic Energy Commission at that time had already been exposed uh, as a... Uh, captured federal regulator and uh, in 1975 had been replaced uh, by, it had been disbanded by Congress and had uh, been uh, refashioned into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but nobody had confidence or patience that we were gonna get any different treatment than what was already controlled by uh, Public Service Company of New Hampshire. So um, that, um, that set the stage for some independent movement apart from the Public Service Commission and the nuclear regulatory, all the commissions that we believed were captured by a, um, an industry. And so, um, it set us on the path towards, as Neely was explaining, the establishment of, uh, of a um, grassroots movement that um, you know, we were operating by mimeograph machines at this time. Mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have conference call services on our telephone. Yeah, yeah. Paul, Paul um, can, I, uh, can, I, can I interrupt? I just... Just, I want to know, you keep saying, we did this, we did that. At the very beginning, who who were you? Um, it Granite sounds State like you- Alliance. Okay. I would say primarily the Granite State Alliance. But, but you know- How the many Granite people? State, oh, I don't know how many people the uh, GSA had, but it was primarily coordinated around a newsletter. And, um, uh, and, and again, I- I wasn't necessarily part of the Granite State Alliance or the uh, the movement that had um, been involved in the Onassis campaign. I was really a part of a of a um, of a uh, a fruit pickers guild at that time called the Greenleaf Harvesters. We raked blueberries. We uh, picked uh, apple orchards, uh, we pruned apple trees, uh, but we were a guild of sorts uh, that was predominantly <clears throat> um, a loose network of 
of anti-war activists who were at the same time opposing uh, federal income tax. So, um, you know, we were, uh, we were an activist based organization or guild as it were, where we would twithe our wages. A, a twithe is a, is a double tithe. So 20% of our wages uh, in agricultural work went towards um, the, um, you know, the, the Vietnamese Buddhist uh, church in Vietnam, uh, but uh, also uh, it was uh, supporting um, direct uh, financial support to prisoners family centers in New Hampshire. But um, the, uh, the, the Greenleaf Harvesters then got merged with all these other groups that were part of the Granite State Alliance and we um, organized a march from Manchester to Seabrook that went mm. town to town, uh, basically taking from Einstein's quote, from the village square will come, uh, we must take the message to America and there will come the voice uh, on nuclear power. And, you know, he, Einstein organized this, um, uh, maybe Nelia or Arnie could uh, get that quote correct, but um, <clears throat> the idea was, and we, we organized uh, on, you know, taking a, a walk from Manchester to each of the village squares there and on to Seabrook, where in the evenings we were, we were organizing talks. So it was a direct face-to-face -face with communities. Uh, that was later adapted from, uh, with a wagon, a horse-drawn wagon with a puppet show called uh, um, Burnt Toast Trouble the Nation's Bread Basket that uh, the puppeteer would later become a, a New Hampshire field organizer for the American Friends Service Committee. But um, he um, and we uh, made a wagon into a puppet show. And again, on that principle of going from village square to village square, uh, we went through, we went to each of the town commons between Winchester, New Hampshire, and for 10 days uh, got, uh, people together, you know, largely by appealing to their children to come out and see the puppet show. And uh, then um, the Granite State Alliance was also wait, doing- wait, can, I, can I jump in? Can I, can I just, just redirect a little, Paul, because you're saying something very fundamental here and maybe Nelia can answer too. How did you establish links with the town of Seabrook and, and how did you know or gauge or organize them to be opposed very locally to the nuclear station? Well, I'll just mention quickly and then Neil, you had to chime in. The, the town of Seabrook in its, um, it would have been the um, town meeting of 1975 had, put together a warrant article saying they were opposed to the construction of a nuclear power station in the town of Seabrook. And um, Governor Meldrum Thompson overruled their, you know, basically told New Hampshire uh, and the city or the town of Seabrook that it wasn't appropriate for them to vote against the uh, Seabrook nuclear power station. But um, that popularized, a, a local town vote popularized the opposition within the town of Seabrook that then had some weight on the fact that here again, it was a big corporation coming down on local home rule. And Neil yeah. or Arnie, you are free to add to that. But that's that's how we got the clamshell got its impetus from a local town vote. 
initially. Uh, Neil and Arnie, do you, do you want to add to that? Arnie, oh, no. please come in. Yeah, I, I guess what I would say, Dave, is that, um, again, the point was that by 1976, when the um, federal authorities granted the utility company permission to build a nuclear plant, there was already opposition that was local and there was already connections around New Hampshire and around New England. So it was at that point that people decided it was time to step outside the sort of conventional process of politics with lawyers and hearings and such and go into and to apply the techniques of nonviolent direct action that people had learned about through earlier movements that had come before and civil rights and uh, anti-war movements in particular from that period of time. And that was when people got together at, around the picnic table at Guy Chichester's house in Rye, New Hampshire in the summer of 1976 and formed an organization and decided to call it the Clamshell Alliance that would be dedicated to grassroots community education and nonviolent direct action to try to prevent construction of a nuclear power plant. From the outset, the organization was defined as a New England organization. Guy was uh, one of the principal organizers and spokespeople against the uh, Onassis oil uh, drilling operation. Right. So he had a lot of no notoriety already. Yeah, and I me... will add too that there was a tremendous influence of the Gandhian movement. Um, the Greenleaf Harvesters were was really founded by somebody named. Well, it's important not we always avoided pivotal leadership. Um, we were constantly rotating and delegating, and pairing experienced people with inexperienced people, and we did that consistently and very consciously, deliberately, as a strategy in Clamshell. And as we grew, and we grew so fast, we died of our own weight, one some might say, um, a non-issue became the center of the national energy debate in only four years. I don't know of any other campaign in history that's done that in this country. But um, because we were always pairing people with experience with inexperience and careful gender balancing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, disabilities, able-bodied, et cetera, you know, any, working class and we were always pairing people um but uh the green leaf harvesters which which paul was very involved with um i'd grown up with arthur harvey who put together probably the it might still be the preeminent collection of gandhian literature in the united states in english um Mail order. and pardon it was by mail order. Exactly, by mail order. Exactly. And he's still doing it by mail order. And he's got a 99% customer satisfaction rate with Amazon. He's, he's gotten quite technical in his, you know, he's, he's gone with the flow with the new technologies. But he was doing it all by, you know, snail mail originally. And he still, I believe, has the largest collection of English Gandhian literature in the United States. Um, he's, he's become an organic inspector. Um, for the state of Maine, um, and he's still winnowing blueberries. <laughs> he he does commercial blueberry, uh, wild blueberry um, harvesting. Uh, at any rate, so there was a very very. I'd grown up with Arthur Harvey. Um, he was one of the elders in and out. Or well, he was elders. <laughs> I was a child. He was one of the adults who was. He was in his twenties. He was one of the adults in and out of my parents' home. Um, and um, a very strong commitment to, to Gandhian nonviolent action and the lessons of Gandhi. Uh, you know, some of my elders who were going back and forth to India studying the Gandhian land reform movement, et cetera, et cetera. So this was this was really quite commonplace, or at, at least in the heart of the movement, there was a very strong connection to the people who'd worked directly with Gandhi. This wasn't that many decades after Gandhi. So there was a direct link to some of that, and that was very strong and very vitally alive. Um, and we were quite aware of it. And Clamshell deliberately cited Gandhi when um, our third action, we recognized we weren't ready. And so we converted the civil disobedience into a renewable energy fair on the state beach. 
Mm -hmm. um, until we were ready. And for the second anniversary of the ending of the Vietnam War, we were ready for our third action, third civil disobedience action. But there were many, 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 so, many others. So, Nellie, how did you know? How did you know when you were ready? <laughs> well, they announced construction. They, it would, you know, the, the, uh, well, it, there was also the fact that I, you can't, we can't ignore the fact that um, New Hampshire at that time was, uh, you know, an extreme right wing. Um, we had the uh, uh, Governor Meldrum Thompson. Well, I guess, who saying, was, Paul, uh, I'm saying this is, I'm not asking a question about the external conditions, the way Nellia was making it sound as if internally, the movement was ready for a civil disobedience action and you knew it at some point. And I'm asking, was, how, did you, how did you make that judgment? I would say that it was by um, the influence of the Quaker consensus process that um, we had some really dynamite yeah. teachers um, yeah. from the, uh, you know, with the American Friends Service Committee uh, but the, the Quaker movement itself uh, instilled in us that particularly because we were talking about risking arrest, we needed to be in full agreement with each other. We, need to, we needed to know each other very well. And part of that was to instill in us a skill, a listening skill that comes with consensus building. And um, that was, um, that, that became a central core of our commitment to nonviolence as well, because we needed and learned um, to um, address, um, you know, that we needed, we needed to really take the time and care uh, to talk things through. Uh, so, um, I'd say that, that that common ground was was developed by consensus and learning uh, what consensus really is. Right, let yes. me ask, let me ask, me ask Nellia here. I mean, how did, how, were you trying to get in there, Arnie? I could have somebody, would, I, I wanna, wanna ask you, Nellia, how did you how did you achieve this consensus? I mean, there must've been moments where it was impossible or there must've been individuals who, uh, wouldn't compromise. Um, you know, give us a sense, maybe through anecdotes of of the friction around this consensus building. Oh, there definitely were frictions, and there definitely was a lot. And I think I saw the abuse of consensus. I'm not a Quaker, but I'd grown up with the Quakers, and I'm a third generation pacifist. So many of my elders were part of the civil rights struggle, then went on to the Vietnam struggle. Um, I'd seen consensus at some pretty, and weighty friends, it's just so powerful. When weighty friends are exercising the best of consensus, it's, it's magic. It's really incredible what can happen there. And that we had much of the weighty friends guiding us, as Paul said. It gives me chills as he was describing Wait, that. What's that phrase mean, weighty friends? Yeah, not not oh, overweight sorry. friends, I suppose. Seasoned, experience, seasoned ah. experience, highly respected elders in the Quaker community who had become respected elders from their conduct and um, skill at facilitating and listening. And, and the other thing that I wanted to add into what Paul, I agree with everything Paul was saying, it was a profound level of respect, a profound level of respect across real differences. There, you know, feminism was a fairly new concept in in the 60s and 70s there were all kinds of the isms part of the agenda was something we would not drop and i really admire the way no coal no gas has integrated so much of this in and you do it so skillfully now i really admire your skill at, at facilitating group meetings and um it's not just the technical skill with the technology but it's i love the way you culturally are so sensitive to so many differences and so inclusive and integrate that. But so we, we were taught to, to listen carefully to each other and to respect across differences. 
And first of all, to be true to oneself, that one's inner voice, one's inner conscience, that silent, small, still inner voice was where, at least in the early days of clamshell, before it got too glitzy, <laughs> um, was where all we were each compelled. This was an impossible David and Goliath struggle. We were not taking this on because we had any chance of winning, but we knew we were right, and we were compelled to act out of conscience. The town of Seabrook had spoken in a democratic majority, and this large corporate interest with money to power was, was coming in and also with the Onassis oil refinery struggle, which was a victory to defeat that. That was some really weighty grassroots grassroots campaigns that where the people had spoken that we were piggybacking off of. Plus, we were also piggybacking directly off the Vietnam War, all of that momentum. This is fascinating. I, I'm going to... I'm going to bring Natty in here um, to give a kind of no coal, no gas um, perspective on terms of points of of of, uh, of 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 comparison and contrast. I mean, partly it's apples and oranges because you in in the Clamshell Alliance were fighting a new project, um, and no coal, no gas has chosen as a target the the coal fired plant at Bow, which is quite old. Um, but maybe you could just say a word, Natty, about the choice of targets the engagement with the local community, um, those kinds of initial questions. Sure. Um, this has been such a rich conversation. Thank you so much. Um, so, so yeah, so um, No Coal, No Gas has uh, coalesced around the Merrimack Generating Station um, on Abenaki land in Bow, New Hampshire, um, which is owned by Granite Shore Power, um, which is, owned then by Atlas Holdings, which is a private equity firm um, in Greenwich. Um, consequently, it used to be owned also by Castleton Commodities, which divested um, completely from coal last year. Um, but yeah, so uh, by the time we uh, sort of uh, coalesced around uh, Merrimack Generating Station, it was the last coal burning plant in New England without a shutdown date. Um, the last, the second to last one being Bridgeport, Connecticut, which has si since shut down. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of things about Merrimack Generating Station um, in particular. It's a peaker plant, which is a, a plant that only runs um, during the coldest and hottest mom months when uh, the energy demand is at its highest. Um, and yet it gets forward capacity payments to just uh, be at the ready, be on call uh, just in case it needs to run. Um, and it also only contributes about 1% of, um, of our energy in New England, um, while also uh, generating an enormous amount of emissions. And um, Natty, Natty, can I, I just redirect yeah. a little bit? Because I think people people are here. They know, they know most of that. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that you you did no how did no coal no gas choose that target as opposed to some others uh, you know and and how have you dealt with the fact that there is no resolution from the town of bow equivalent to the one that the town of seabrook took out in 75 sure yeah so um you know i think that the uh sort of antiquity of coal uh did have something to do with it it was compelling to try and eradicate coal completely from new england um since this was the last uh coal burning plant um and i think that our engagement uh with the area of bow has been um you know largely on an individual level we've created a lot of uh individual uh relationships with folks who are there um, and, you know, tried to, uh, you know, do as much kind of grassroots organizing as possible. And we've had, uh, you know, we've had a, a few really wonderful allies in Bo, um, families who are recognizing the impacts of the plant. Um, but I think that, you know, we're trying to strike the balance of recognizing that, you know, even though the majority of us aren't from Bo, um, we're also uh, breathing the air that is uh, being produced, right? Like you can't have sort of sectioned off uh, air. Uh, so, you know, we're all uh, feeling the impacts of coal um, and as New England residents, um, 
and as folks who are also, um, you know, are, are the rates that, you know, we're all rate payers in New England and our bills are still funding both. So even though we're not in that specific area, we're still um, pretty deeply connected. Um, so I think that relationship building is really an ongoing thing. And it um, it's largely happened on an individual level of just, um, you know, building relationships with folks who, um, you know, who are uh, living in the vicinity and trying to support the work that they want to do, as well as recognizing that, you know, we're all, um, you know, we're all feeling the impact of this, of this power plant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Let me, um, let me, let me kick it over to Arnie who put something interesting. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't in the chat. It was to me, but I, I you know, on this question of consensus, um, what, what are the, things, you know, what were the limits, um, the things that, because you could, Nelia mentioned a code of conduct. Um, what were the boundary issues there where you really had to draw a line and try to exclude people? So for one thing, we said everybody who participated in civil disobedience had to attend a nonviolent training session. And as Nelia mentioned, these were typically six to eight hours long. They also had to be a member of an affinity group. And that was a way to keep, in a sense, some control over who was there. So random people couldn't just wander in. Um, and that became particularly important as the actions got larger and larger. It starts with 18 people walking onto basically an empty space down a railroad track. By the following spring, we've got 2,000 people walking onto an active construction site. Um, so it's a it's a big there was a big growth factor that was there, but the fact that we were in affinity groups and that everybody was trained enabled us to have a level of trust. And the fact that everybody agreed to a set of guidelines, which included a commitment to nonviolence, it said we will not run, it said we won't bring dogs, that we're not going to use drugs and alcohol. It wasn't the definition of nonviolence, but it was a a discipline that we all said, yes, we will abide by this. And that, and again, that enabled us to trust total stranger. We had a common ground in how we were going to operate. It was in the planning of these actions, David, that things got very dicey. So take a specific example would be, again, on the first action where Paul and 17 people walked onto the, the construction site, there was nothing there. By this next year, um, there was a concrete batch plant, but not much more. By the next year, there was millions of dollars of investment and millions of dollars of construction equipment, and there was a fence around the place. So then as you're planning a mass nonviolent direct action, the question becomes, well, do we need to get onto the site in order to occupy it? And if so, do we need to cut the fences? And is cutting a fence an act of property damage is that consistent with the commitment to nonviolence? Well, some people thought that property destruction was absolutely consistent with nonviolence and was necessary. Some people thought property destruction was inherently violent. <clears throat> Some people just thought it was going to be a bad idea and that it was going to alienate the local community and that we shouldn't do it. So the planners went around and around. Eventually, some of those discussions are some of the differences are what led to the alliance not being able to continue going into a period of decline. So how did you resolve this question of whether to cut fences? Oh, uh, you know, it was always a you know i mean you can climb over fences we we did we like we you know we've had mobile ladders that eventually would just go over the fence. there was never really any need to destroy property and which is an argument that a lot of us stood firm with but again the you know when you get two thousand people together um and actually i have to say that 
It was the demonstration of June 24, 1978, where we had 8,000 people in affinity groups trained coming in from all over the country. Um, and um, that scared the establishment. And so Governor Meldrum Thompson, who was still, you know, right winging it away, and the Manchester Union leader under William Loeb said that perverts were coming and that they were really terrorists and that they had been informed by a source that they were not coming to be nonviolent. They were coming to destroy the site. Well, it turned out their source was Lyndon LaRouche from the, um, what was it? The, um, the uh, US, you know, US, US Labor, Labor Party. Party. US Labor Party. Yeah. Yes, the US, in the 70s. yes, they were totally right wing. I mean, they, they got a little chorus together and they uh, they based and then Governor Thompson got on the media and said we're not going to tolerate tolerism, or we're not going to tolerate terrorism. We're going to use every means necessary, including bullets. He said over the phone, over the radio, and that scared a lot of people in Seabrook and in our what we call friendlies all around the Seabrook site where. We were staging um, the gathering of thousands of people in their backyards and in their um, in their uh, you know business parking lots, and we had a lot of support. That then this you know they couldn't they couldn't move in a consensual manner to face a potentially a bloodbath, and so they started dropping out. Uh, taking their support uh, away. And it was over that issue, a very smart um, but devious plan that there was then a counter offered made by the Attorney General uh, uh, Raff, um, um, and who offered that, uh, you know, look, uh, We'll let you come on the site for three days if you promise to leave. And um, given that we lost consensus of supporting um, the civil disobedience, uh, we there there was an agreement, and and that was really the first real rub we had with consensus. And so we had people arriving from all over, and this this again was. A process was engaged in the weeks leading up to the actual event. So we'd already put out the word there was going to be, you know, we'd already had training events, in, you know, you know, um, the Summertown, Tennessee farm folks with uh, 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 Stephen Gaskin uh, had several busloads come up to Seabrook ready for civil disobedience, only to be greeted and say, look, you know, we're going to have a three day, you know, uh, Bonnie Raitt, you know, we're going to bring in all, you know, Dick Gregory, you know, we just had a superb list. Dr. But Brown. after three days, we're going to leave this site cleaner than we came. <clears throat> and uh, that blew things apart. And we never got it back together after that. And that there were break offs. Um, the Coalition for Direct Action then started uh, actions in 1979, 1980, that basically said, you know, cutting fences is not a problem unless there are thousands of cops on the inside of that fence. And so when you cut it, they come pouring out with batons and gas. And that's exactly what happened. Hmm. So did and the training- it was indistinguishable, I would add, whether whether these were lefty, dedicated, sincere anarchists or whether they were paid infiltrators, the effect was indistinguishable. And I personally, I'm sorry to say this because it doesn't comply with my nonviolent convictions, 
But I don't think I will ever trust a member of the Hard Rain Affinity Group, and I do occasionally run into them. I, I will never trust them, and they're, some of them are very pleasant to me. I, I don't care whether they were lefty politicos or whether they were paid infiltrators. The effect on the movement was indistinguishable, and the level of public perception. Now, the state, the state police, at, you know, at the highest levels of the state, I think they understood this distinction pretty well. But the general public got very confused, and they deliberately, the Coalition for Direct Action at Seabrook, um, sort of which was centered around the Hard Rain Affinity Group, always they 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 blurred the distinctions and the differences. You know, they couldn't use the name Clamshell Alliance, but they stole our logo. You no, know, and they were, mm. you know, not just fence cutting. They were wearing gas masks and helmets and out skirmishing the police and running after dark. And, um, you know, the police were getting scared. Some of, you know, I talked to policemen who were just scared of dealing with these people. Right. They didn't know what was going to happen. So Next. I want to make sure that people, who, people can ask questions because I believe we're scheduled to wrap up around 830. So please, I'm going to ask one more question now. And then I hope people will put, put their names down in the chat um, so I can call on you shortly. Um, my question in relation to what you're saying, Nelia, is that was there some way that the training, I mean, the six to eight hour training, I thought was designed to get everybody onto the same page and functioned as a kind of security culture too, it seems to keep out infiltrators and representatives of the state and so on. So is there some way that the training wasn't sufficient or if you look at it in hindsight, could the training have been done differently so that the, the coalition as it grew still stayed together or was this, was this problem just inevitable? I'd love to hear Arnie's and Paul's take on that. Let me just say really quick that there were there were there were intervening events. Um, in March of 1979, Three Mile Island blew up. Mm. So there was a strong voice for saying the time for symbolic actions is over. These things are blowing up now. And so that gave impetus to those who, you know, it was a little bit of macho in it for sure, but they you know, you know, there was a, I'm not, you know, there was, there was always this divide between tactical nonviolence and principled nonviolence. And so, you know, um, plowshares actions, these are principled actions, but, you know, people are, and life is, carries more respect than property. So, you know, there is this inner debate that, you know, is ongoing in terms of how far do you take nonviolence? It, it, does it apply to property all the time? Well, that broke down pretty quick after Three Mile Island happened. And so the actions uh, into October 1979 were, you know, there was no way we were going to talk anybody out of cutting a fence, um, except that tactically, it wasn't going to work. There were no arrests following the October 1979 uh, nonviolent or you know, direct action, as it was called. They dropped nonviolent. But that was because the police took care of it uh, by just dispersing people in clouds of gas, hoses, and batons. So that was a bad tactical decision. Um, but um, that was, uh, you know, it's you, we eventually did take three a three year high or actually it's probably four year hiatus, um, and came back with the principled nonviolent direct actions where we honored property and we just went over the fences and you know there were uh, you know there was a, there was wave actions of of uh, civil disobedience where we just put ladders over the fences and climbed into the property and sat down and waited to be arrested. And that's when the Seabrook Police Department took on the idea of maybe we can just charge these guys with 
uh, RICO, and you know that they're running up the costs of of um, the, these direct actions to undermine our economy. And they tried to recall. They tried to say we were a corrupt organization at that time, but the U.S. Attorney's Office in Concord said, "Look, these people, they." They are operating on a principle of nonviolence. That's their byline. And so the federal government never charged the clamshell with RICO. But that, you know, that there is a value to establishing yourself um, that um, it is it's worth worth the wait. Okay. Um this is fascinating. Is there anybody from the audience who'd like to uh, ask a question here, um, you know, to make this even more relevant to no coal, no gases, current concerns? I'm hoping that that uh, some, of, some of us can, can, can ask a question that pushes the conversation even more in that direction. Ah, Morgan, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, just maybe like getting into more detail i'm not sure i totally follow the the timeline uh of the that specific event that didn't end well and and was a source of a lot of problem in, for the organization itself it's just it made me think about how long you need to plan those things ahead because as i understand you got a lot of people kind of at the last moment and they could take that training kind of very er, like very late um, did I get that right? Or just, I have a general question of like, should you allow some of, it's, it's, I'm sure it's a very enthusiastic to have a lot of people joining at the very, in the last month or something, but may, is that, is that something you should, as a good experience, knowing that maybe not, you know, <laughs> maybe you, 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 you have to have people who agree on at least the strategy for that specific event, because I'm, can be wondering all those debates can be endless, but you can say for that specific event, we decided we will not do this. Everybody with us agree with that, sort of like weeks, months ahead of the thing. It's a general question of the timeline and how you how you you stop getting people in at the very last moment. Well, there there was a again we were through the American Friends Service Committee and others, um, we were doing trainer training for trainers. So we had an active uh, mobile uh, nonviolence training uh, session. But, you know, again, um, there, there, are, there are all these other inter interceding events where, um, you know, people came to the 70, 1977 event where we had 2,000 people on site and a large offsite support group that was getting us water and food and you know keeping things going. And a lot of those people, the 1,414 people or 1,415, I think it actually turned out to be, um, in these affinity groups, they were from all over the place. Arnie came up from Connecticut, but we had people from California who then took the code of conduct and they formed the Abalone Alliance, another bivalve organization on the California coast at Diablo Canyon. But, uh, you know, there was the Crawfish Alliance and in Louisiana. So, you know, one event in New Hampshire spawned um, dozens of, of um, you know, the Shad Alliance in New York uh, on Long Island that stopped, you know, the construction. Um, well, I think it got finished, but they never were able to get it online. But, you know, there were, there, there was a broad anti-nuclear movement that came out of the, uh, the, the, um, the melting pot that, you know, it was a blessing that Governor Thompson locked us up for two weeks in five National Guard armories and three county jails, which became seminars for our movement. Mm. And Paul, Paul let, that, me, let me just, uh, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to get Leaf's question in before we run out of time here. 
please go ahead and leave. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I have a question. I'm reflecting on what you said, Nelia, about um, like communicating your principal nonviolence and then how that um, resulted in people reacting to you. And I'm just thinking about like, there have been a lot of times recently where I've been part of a group that is um, taking what that group considers to be nonviolent action. Um, and it's not seen that way either by the courts or counter protesters or police or the mainstream media. Um, and I was wondering if this happens to happen to you all, if people tried to say that the things you were doing that you consider nonviolence were violent and what you did about that, because um, this has happened to us and I've seen it happen a lot um, in organizing I've done, especially with like young people of color, um, of just like racialized people being portrayed as violent, no matter how nonviolent they are. And I was wondering, did you experience people saying that your nonviolence was violent? And then what did you do about that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, Leif. Um, yeah. Uh, Yeah, we had a code of conduct was pretty clear in terms of the specificity of actions. And because that was so non-ambiguous, it wasn't by any sense comprehensive, but it was very specific and pretty detail oriented. And so that left room for tremendous spontaneity within that code of conduct. And yes, when we were perceived when people tried to paint us as nonviolent, as violent, um, it was pretty clear that it it didn't. At least my perception. I don't know what Arnie or, or Paul would say, but my perception is that that didn't really stick. And there was. The, I think Paul did a very good job of articulating some of the debate within the movement. Yes, principled nonviolence, the plowshares actions. That is definitely principled nonviolent reaction actions where you go in with your own blood and you're destroying grass files or you're using a hammer with your 13 grandchildren's names on it to destroy a missile uh, and, you know the bass ironworks um, nuclear submarine uh, action for instance a friend of um, uh, that's yes clamshell people did try to smear us as being violent at times but it, my perception is it didn't stick. And I'd love to hear Arnie and or Paul's response. I, I think it was through, through our actions leaf. I mean, we've clearly, um, you know, the police got it. I mean, we had, again, if you look at the 1977 occupation where 1,415 people were arrested over a matter of hours and it was perceived as being entirely peaceful. Um, because everybody who was there had been through the training and knew how they were supposed to behave and had role played what happens when the police come up and say you're under arrest. And um, and then we spent two weeks up to we were incarcerated for as long as two weeks in National Guard Armory spread out all over the state. So everybody could sort of see what was going on and it created a model and it created an example. Um, that wasn't, it was just kind of obvious. I mean, the other thing that I would say is that if you're in an action where, where people are, have agreed to a commitment to nonviolence and somebody picks up a rock, um, it's pretty easy to say that, that person is, is out of line with what the other people are doing and it's easy to just move away from that person or just say that person is not the the leader you know just is not representing what this group's values are it's not you know need to be organized and that's why you know having peacekeepers uh having as somebody said in very public in all the communications that the group is doing is very helpful. You know, statements that say something like, we will treat everybody we meet with respect, regardless of whether they uh, agree with us or disagree with us. It's a pretty simple statement to make, but it's very profound. And it's something that people can understand. 
I was just going to say that the mo one of the most meaningful uh, items of the code of conduct was that we will treat everybody that we come in contact with openness and respect, period. And that translated um, effectively uh, in to the media, to the police, to the politicians, to the public. And I, it was sincere. And it has to be sincere. OK, I'm going to. I'm yeah, gonna... That gives me chills. Oh. It gives me chills to hear you say that, Paul, oh. because it was rang so true. It was a profound level of respect for all, regardless. Mm. I'm gonna, and so I'm I was gonna... apologizing to the police when I'm totally limp as a rag. I'm only 130 pounds, but it's 130 pounds of muscle. And if you're completely relaxed, it's hard work to carry people. And because I'm blind and I'm a woman, and because I was not being aggressive or angry or hostile, they didn't want to drag me face down by my beard, you know, as they did some of the or men early on when the kids who were wearing uniforms didn't know how to handle civil disobedience people at the beginning. Paul was subjected to some uh, of that. Nel Nelia, before I was gonna I was gonna try to wrap <laughs> things up, but you've said something Good. very interesting here. So the clams had respect for the police. Can you elaborate more on how you dealt how you how you felt and how you dealt with the police? A profound level of respect and trying to reach their humanity with no cooperation for their authority. <laughs> None. <laughs> but at the same time, communicating to the best of my imperfect ability a profound level of respect for their humanity. Okay. Sometimes it involved humor, and but more often it was sincere, genuine, sincere um, humility and, and a caring, a, a depth of caring for them because I was straining their backs. So if you'd but had members, relaxed. if you'd had members of the group who were police abolitionists, um, would you have tried to train them uh, away from that? Or how would you have handled that philosophical disagreement about the police? We well, only asked people practical. to abide by the code of conduct for this action. We were not trying to, we were, I'm a third generation pacifist. We were not preaching pacifism. But for the purposes of this action, our code of conduct didn't say that we will be nonviolent. I don't want to be standing on the railroad tracks with a train approaching me debating what is or isn't nonviolent. <laughs> we don't have time as the train's approaching. I almost didn't participate in the Albany train blockade, I don't know, five, 10 years ago because their code of conduct didn't have any specificity. I don't want to put my life in jeopardy. Right, so the code of conduct said that the police abolitionist who is taking part in one of your actions should act as if they respect the police for the, for the time for of that this action. action. For this action, exactly. if they're going to be part of this action, they, must, they are agreeing to abide by this code of conduct that was part of every affinity group training session universally. Mm. Yeah, actually, Barbara. Had what I would add to that is it's not a matter of respecting the police as an institution. It's a matter of, of how do you relate to an individual who happens to be wearing a uniform and carrying a gun is a different question. Mm. All right, that's a very useful distinction. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Barbara made the same point uh, very articulately in the chat. Um, so, so I want to. I want to. Get, kind of give Natty the last word here in terms of a reflection on, on what's been said from no coal, no gases perspective. And, and maybe I'll just set that up a tiny bit. I mean, it seems that what happened is that Three Mile Island melted down, um, which no one expected to happen when it did happen. And this gave a huge shot in the arm to the movement, but things has also got out of control at that point. Um, and so we can imagine that if the equivalent thing happens in the anti-fossil fuel movement, how will no coal, no gas cope with it? Um, there are various scenarios out there. You, you may, many of you may have read uh, Stan, Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry of the Future, uh, science fiction, which begins with a mass death 
uh, caused by a heat wave in northwestern India. Very, very plausible scenario. It almost happened in Karachi uh, last April, just a degree or two more, and it would have been Kim Stanley Robinson's scenario. And, uh, you know, if God forbid that happens, at least we can hope that 2,000 people want to come to our next action against the coal-fired plant in Bo. So then that they tell us, tell us how is no coal, no gas set up to cope and to benefit from that or, or not? That's such a great question. Um, well, I mean, first of all, welcome. Um, and I would say, um, second of all, you know, this, this whole conversation uh, leading up to your, your question, David, uh, is really making me think about legacy, right? Like what an incredible, uh, blessing that we have so many mentors who are, uh, you know, have gone before us, but are also right here in this Zoom room who have done these things before um, that we can learn from. So I think, you know, the first thing I said, I, I'm not sure if I could uh, really accurately predict uh, what No Coal, No Gas would do um, with 2,000 extra people in Bono, Hampshire. I think that uh, we would meet it with responsiveness and intentionality, but um, but really, I think, you know, what I'm reflecting on right now is that, uh, you know, we are part of an ecosystem of movements um, and the scenarios that we might plan for the future um, have likely already happened in some space somewhere. So um, this is really just hammering home for me the importance of these kinds of connections and of learning from uh, the folks who have been doing this for decades, the folks who have uh, you know, been writing about it, been sharing their knowledge, um, and that, you know, no coal, no gas isn't doing this in a vacuum at all, right? Like we wouldn't, um, I don't envision a scenario where we would uh, be planning uh, just amongst ourselves for what to do is that we'd be reaching out to uh, networks of folks who have, um, who have dedicated themselves to this work in so many different ways. So um, really, I'm just reflecting on how lucky are we that we get to be in these kinds of networks with these kinds of relationship, uh, excuse me, with relationships with people doing this work. All right, thanks, Natty. Um, good, I do think it's fair to say that no coal, no gas is part of the legacy of the Clamshell Alliance. And I hope this is the first of many conversations yeah. where we're harvesting your wisdom and pushing it forward um, in the fight against fossil fuels. Uh, so thank you enormously, uh, Nelia, Paul, and Arnie, um, for your uh, for your wisdom here. Uh, with that, I'm going to kick it back to Leif. Thanks, David, um, and thanks everyone for coming. This has been um, really cool to get to talk this way. And in future mass calls, um, we've been doing different topics each time, so we will likely touch on some of these themes again. Um, there's been expressed some interest at, to at some point have a mass call more specifically about this concept of police abolition. Um, so that might be on the horizon as well as many other things about multi-generational movements, how we can all work together, structure, strategy, et cetera. So I'm really glad you're all here and you'll keep coming. And Rose has uh, a reminder about onboarding. Um, so if you liked this or if you didn't like it, but like other things we do, uh, we would love to have you come to these onboarding things. So Rose. I put the onboarding session registration form reminder. It's um, February 2nd at 7 p.m. I'll be leading it um, in the chat um, as well as the Facebook event. Those links will also, I think, be sent out after this meeting via email. Um, and if you have any other questions about onboarding, I'll also just put my email in there and feel free to reach out individually as well. Um, but I hope to see you all there. I would just like to say thank you. What an honor it is to be part of this. Yeah, and I'll just close by saying that I feel um, the affinity very strongly. You know, it, I particularly um, when uh, Natty said that, you know, the Abenaki are there on that coal site as well. I mean, that, you know, the, the legacy goes back that far, and it's much appreciated to be recognized.
Have a nice evening, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, friends. Bye-bye. No nukes, no coal, no gas. <laughs> good night, everybody. Thank you. And no fossil fuels, for sure. No coal, no gas. Thanks, everybody. Woo. Bye. Oh, uh, hang on. Thanks, y'all. I'm gonna um end the call now so I can upload the recording. Um, thank you all so much. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Nelia. Thank you, Rose. Bye, Nelia. Thank you so much. This is Leif. Thank you. Bye for Bye. now. Bye. See, talk to you later. Bye. I hope so. Soon. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Have a nice night.